Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we very much appreciate your uh, support and for joining us for the uh, final round of the Heart Cup this evening. My name is Chris Gerard. I'm the president of the Moot Court Board here. And on behalf of the board, uh, we'd like to extend our thanks to all of you, and particularly to Dean Levy, to Professor Andrew Sear, our faculty advisor, and the LARW faculty. You're going to hear a couple opening remarks from our Heart Cup coordinators, and they're going to go through the problem and introduce our finalists, describe the judges. But on behalf of the board, I'd like to extend a special thank you to the three of them, uh, Danny Stockton, Chantal Carlos, and Jyothi Jindal. They have put in a tremendous amount of effort to make this competition a successful event, and I think they've done an incredible job. Finally, if everyone would mind pulling out your cell phones and making sure that they're not going to ring, buzz, ding during the final round, we'd very much appreciate that. And if you wouldn't mind staying in your seats until the end of the arguments, we hope to avoid any distractions to the competitors and the judges. Thank you all very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming. My name is Jody Jindal, and I am one of the three Heart Cup coordinators. We'd like to begin by thanking Judge Niemeyer, Judge Duncan, and Judge Dever for make, taking the time to prepare for today's arguments and to join us for the Heart Cup final round. The finalists and the Duke Law community benefit from the expertise and the skill these jurors are generously willing to share with us. We are also grateful for Dean Levy's consistent support of our intramural moot court competitions, including the Heart Cup. This round would not be judged by a panel of this caliber without the efforts of Dean Levy and Judy Hammerschmidt. Special thanks also to Professor Metzloff for his continued support of the Heart Cup. We appreciate the legal writing faculty's cooperation in administering the tournament's first round, and particularly Professor Mullum for his advice and suggestions on almost every aspect of this competition. We simply could not have put this tournament together without the assistance of Laura Grisham and Elizabeth Green in the events office, Sandra McLaughlin in the dean's office, Hannah Beardsley in the clerkship office, as well as Tina Moore in the library. Thank you for your patience and willingness to help us with all the tournament logistics, of which there were many. Um, we are deeply grateful also to Professor Andrew Sear for providing feedback on this year's problem packets and making suggestions for their improvement. We value the Hard Cup tradition of having professors and practitioners judge the quarterfinal and semifinal rounds. We would like to thank Professors Bloker, Coleman, Cox, Griffin, Miller, and Professor Mullum. Um, practitioners Jim Maxwell, Phil Rubin, and Paul Sun for setting aside their Tuesday evening and volunteering to judge. This tournament would not also really big, huge thanks um, to every member of the Moot Court Board who judged these arguments. They put in countless hours, and we really could not have done this without their help. Um, today, the finalists will be arguing Horn v. United States Department of Agriculture. The Horns are raisin farmers. Each year, under the Raisin Marketing Order, the Raisin Administrative Committee, or RAC, requires every raisin farm to reserve a certain amount of its raisins for sale by the RAC in non-competitive secondary markets. The purpose of the reserve program is to stabilize the raisin market and eliminate the severe price fluctuations that plagued it in the early 1920s. The proceeds from these reserve tonnage raisins are then used to pay the operating costs of the rack, with the remainder distributed equitably among the raisin farmers. The Horns argue that the reserve requirement is a per se taking and that the equitable interest retained is not just compensation. Personal property is protected under the Fifth Amendment in relevant part nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. The Supreme Court, however, has never previously held that a government regulation executes a per se taking of personal property. Consequently, the court must decide first which of its per se takings frameworks derived from seminal takings cases involving real property is the best approach to determine if the reserve requirement is indeed a per se taking of personal property. There are two frameworks at issue. The first derives from Loretto, uh, which inquires whether the reserve requirement is analogous to a permanent physical occupation of real property. The second derives from the two cases, Nolan and Dolan, and it inquires whether the reserve requirement is analogous to a condition on the grant of a land use permit requiring the forfeiture of a property right. And if so, whether the re reserve requirement bears a sufficient nexus 
and is reasonably, or I'm sorry, roughly proportional to the specific interests that the government seeks to protect. If the court decides that the reserve requirement is a per se taking under either framework, it must then decide whether the equitable interest retained in the proceeds from the sale of the reserve raisins in non-competitive secondary markets, like for school lunches, is just compensation. In some years, the net proceeds have been substantial. In others, zero. The case is on appeal from the Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, which decided in favor of the Department of Agriculture, holding that Loretto did not apply and that the reserve requirement was not a taking under Nolan Dolan. The Ninth Circuit did not reach the issue of just compensation. The Supreme Court of the United States granted certiorari, I'm sorry, certiorari on two questions. One, whether the transfer of title to the reserve tonnage raisins to an agent of the federal government is a per se taking. And two, if the reserve requirement is a per se taking, whether the equitable interest retained suffices as just compensation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my privilege to introduce our panel today. Joining us is the Honorable Paul Nehemiah of the US Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. Judge Nehemiah was nominated to the bench by President George H.W. Bush in 1990. Before his appointment to the Fourth Circuit, Judge Nehemiah served as a US District Judge in the District of Maryland. Before taking the bench, Judge Nehemiah was in private practice in the law firm of Piper and Marbury. He chaired the project to rewrite the rules of procedure in Maryland and co-authored the Maryland Rules Commentary, which is now in its third edition. Judge Nehemiah was also a member of the Advisory Committee on the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure for seven years, chairing the committee for four. He's a member of the America Law Institute, a fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers, and a fellow of the American Bars Foundation. He graduated from Kenyon College and received his JD LLB degree from the University of Notre Dame, where he was on the editorial board of the Law Review. Also joining us is the Honorable Allison Duncan of the Fourth Circuit. Judge Duncan was nominated to serve as a judge on the Fourth Circuit by President George W. Bush. Before her appointment, George, Judge Duncan served as legal counsel to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. She sat briefly as an associate judge on the North Carolina Court of Appeals before being appointed to the North Carolina Utilities Commission on which she served as a commissioner. She then entered private practice, ultimately becoming a partner in a large Raleigh law firm. Judge Duncan is the first Afri African American woman and the first female North Carolinian to sit on the Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. Judge Duncan served as a law clerk to the Honorable Julia Cooper Mack of the District of Columbia Court of Appeals. She's a graduate of Hampton University and a Duke University School of Law. And finally, the Honorable James Dever, the US District Court for the Eastern District of North Carolina. Judge Dever was nominated by also George W. Bush to a seat on the United States District Court for the Eastern District of North Carolina in 2005. He has been the chief judge for the Eastern District of North Carolina since 2001. Before taking the bench, Judge Dever was a US magistrate judge for the Eastern District of North Carolina. He served in the US Air Force as a member of the General Counsel Office from 1988 to 1992, remaining a US Air Force Reserve Officer until 2000. Currently, he is a senior lecturing fellow here at Duke Law School. Judge Dever was a law clerk for the Honorable J. Clifford Wallace of the US District Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. He received his bachelor's degree from the University of Notre Dame and a JD from Duke University School of Law. Good evening, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I have the privilege to introduce our two excellent finalists that we have arguing for us tonight. Uh, for the petitioners, Marvin D. Horn and Laura R. Horn, we have Jordan Glassberg. Jordan is a 1L from Manalapan, New Jersey. He graduated from Johns Hopkins University with a double major in philosophy and political science. While in college, Jordan was the president of the Johns Hopkins mock trial team and interned at the New Jersey Office of the Public Defender. Prior to Duke Law, Jordan spent two years as a litigation legal assistant with Sullivan and Cromwell in New York City. 
At Duke, at Duke, Jordan is on the mock trial board and a 1L representative for Duke's chapter of the American Civil Liberties Union. This summer, he will be working at the United States Attorney's Office for the District of New Jersey. For the respondent, we have Will Hawkins. Will is a 1L from Pine Top, Arizona. He graduated from Duke University with a major in public policy and a minor in political science. After graduation, Will worked for a year in Washington, D.C. for Congressman Scott Garrett. Here at Duke Law, Will has been a member of the Federalist Society and the Mock Trial Board. This summer, he will be working at the Department of Justice Civil Division in Washington, D.C. Please give our finalists a round of applause. And now we'll welcome the judges in. Thank you. Court of the United States. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. All persons having business before the Honorable the Supreme Court of the United States are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this honorable court. All right, be seated, please. All right, uh, Mr. Glassberg, we're going to hear from you first. Yes, sir. All right. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, my name is Jordan Glassberg, counsel for the petitioners Marvin Horn and Laura Horn doing business as Raisin Valley Farms. With the court's permission, I would like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal. <clears throat> Your Honors, this case is about ensuring that family-owned farms receive their constitutionally protected right not to be deprived of property without just compensation. This court should reverse the Court of Appeals and hold that the forced transfer of a portion of the Horns raisin crop amounts to a per se taking under either of the takings analytic. Forced transfer? Yes, Your Honor. Weren't they told simply to hold it in reserve? Yes, Your Honor, but these raisins. Transferred under controlled conditions? Yes, Your Honor, that's correct. But the government, upon becoming raisin farmers, the Horns were forced by the government to keep a separate containment of raisins for the government's account on their own land. Well, that's not a transfer, is it? Your Honor, the, it transferred from the Horns' property to the government's property. Why do you say that? What, what, what was the evidence of a transfer of a property interest? Well, Your Honor, the, the RAC automatically takes title to these raisins. They have title, and they have full ability to decide how these raisins get distributed in the market, to whom they are sold, full ability of how they're going to sell these market, these raisins. The horns have lost ability to exclude others from their property. The only property right that the horns maintain is an equitable interest in these raisins, which in recent years has turned out to be almost nothing. And the equitable interest is the what, <coughs> proceeds from the sale? That's correct, Your Honor. The proceeds that the RAC receives and then distributes back to the farmers. Mr. Glassberg, do you um, challenge the underlying purpose of the statute? Do you dispute the fact that, as producers, that you benefited from the more stable pricing regimen that the statute was designed to create? Your Honor, we dispute that the government has sufficiently shown that this has that effect on the market. Um, under the Dolan standard, the government must show rough proportionality in addition to sufficient nexus. They must show that the burden that they are placing on the farmers must be roughly proportional in its extent to the interest they are seeking. Well, I think you're getting a little bit ahead of my question. My question is more on the front end. Yes, Your Honor. 
Uh, is it your position that the that historically that raisin producers have not benefited from the element of stability that the that the statute was designed to create in the in the pricing market? Your Honor, it has produced a stable market over the long time that it has been in effect. However, recently it has failed to be as effective. And even if it does have an effect on the market, in Penn Central versus New York City, this court held that it still will be a taking without regard to whether it has a, a, an extreme public benefit to the community. But do you, it seems uh, on its face then that what you're asking for is the benefit that the statute was created to, to give you, and that is uh, some predictability in how much you'll be able to earn for your raisin. And at the same time, to, to obtain some compensation for the very mechanism that the statute puts into place to create the stability. Your Honor, even if it did create stability, though, it does not change the fact that if it was an unconstitutional taking, these farmers deserve fair market value. Time and time again, this court has held that when there is a taking, the compensation is what the owner has lost, and that's determined by fair market value. If the, uh, if the government imposed a tax equal to the market value of the raisins. Could it do that? Your Honor, that wouldn't be as, uh, as much of a taking as exists here in that the government wouldn't it have so many property rights that they currently do over this, these raisins. Now, a Loretto-style taking occurs here both because of the horns land and the horns raisins because the horns must hold their raisins on their own land in a separate containment. They therefore, their land is burdened and they are unable to use their land. Is it, Will you say, oh, go ahead. You, this is a highly regulated uh, agricultural market, right? Yes, Your Honor. And the, the, the government going back to all the way to, to Wickard can actually limit the production of wheat. That was the Wickard case. So isn't this just a variant of, of, of that? If the government has that greater power to say, you can't grow raisins on your land, what is different about this case? Your Honor, the difference in this case is that the horns grew these raisins, and then the government came in and said, these are ours now. We have now taken title to these raisins, and you must keep this still on your own property. Therefore, the So if the government said, just taking that question a step further, if the government said, you can't grow 20% of your crop this year because we have a market problem, oversupply, and tell you you can't grow the grapes necessary for 20% of your production. Uh, would that be okay? Your Honor, that would be okay. That wouldn't be a take. So if they actually take the next step, let them grow it, and then say you can't sell it, you say that's the taking? Right. Yes, Your Honor. That is the taking in that it exists. The horns have property rights to it, to it, and then the government comes in and says, now these are ours. Well, how do you respond to the government's argument that of voluntariness? You have complete ability to decide you're going to grow something else or grow uh, or just grow the grapes in their raw form, I think. Is that, isn't that an option that you have? Yes, Your Honor. However, the horns voluntarily chose to be raisin farmers, and then the government came in and forced them into this program. The horns did not voluntarily choose to be part of this program. Loretto footnote 8 actually argues specifically against that type of reasoning, saying that to say that a property owner has the choice between being deprived of their property or giving up their livelihood is a fictitious choice, and property owners' rights should not be so easily manipulated. This is really the choice of giving up your livelihood or abandoning your constitutional rights. Right. What grapes were these? Uh, Your Honor, uh, I believe they grew a variety of different types of grapes. Uh, not exactly sure the specific This is California, type. right? Yes, Your Honor. Wine country. Yes, Your Honor. All right. They could have done sold it for wine, right? Yes, Your Honor, but they chose to be raisin farmers, and then the government imposed this burden on them to hold these raisins in a separate supply. Theoretically, the government says, I suppose they're going to say, uh, we uh, sold them at the best price we could get and give you the proceeds. And uh, so it's really not a taking. We're going to give you the proceeds of those grapes. We're just uh, regulating the timing of them going on the market in order to stabilize the market. 
Well, Your Honor, the RAC sells the raisins that they keep on, in non-competitive markets at below market price. They then use the proceeds to fund over half of their own budget. What ends up coming into the horns is so minimal that it cannot be equated with fair market value. It's a small sliver of what the horns would have gotten if they had actually been able to sell their raisins on the open market. What's the statute say uh, the duty on the government is in disposing of those grapes? What's the language? Uh, Your Honor, they do have to try to sell those in the way most beneficial to the farmers. However, we dispute that they have been able to show that they have been truthfully doing well, that. That's just a breach of statute, really, isn't it? That's not a taking. It, uh, they may have de uh, not gotten the best, and you can challenge them for breach of the statute, couldn't you? Your Honor, that, that could be a breach of the statute, but the fact is that they have failed to get fair market value for the raisins that were distributed to the RAC, and therefore it's also a taking under the Dolan standard that requires the court bring up rough proportionality to prove that the burden that they are putting on these farmers, which in certain years can be two-thirds of their entire raising crop. Is that, is that in the record, that they have failed to obtain fair market value, or do, or do you extrapolate that from the fact that they are selling in a non-competitive market? The second, Your Honor, and the fact that it's sold in non-competitive markets shows that it therefore is not fair market value. Now, why do, why do you say that? It could be that the market they're selling in is uh, sort of a market that doesn't, isn't accessible to competitors and is uh, still fairly expensive. The military spends more money uh, than they should be in a lot of markets. Your Honor, that's correct. However, when the court in previous cases has talked about fair market value, it's our understanding that that always means the normal general market and not a non-competitive market that the RAC chose to create on its own and sell at what they admit are below market price. That's the RAC's own words. Does the record in this case show how much was lost for the applicable years in this case? Um, Your Honor, uh, differential between what was obtained in the government sale and the market value for that given year. No, Your Honor, we don't have that information. It, it, is the, the, what is the remedy that you seek here? Is, isn't the, the fine that was the, the, the fine that was imposed what the government said was the market value of the raisins? So that basically you just want reverse remand. There doesn't even have to be a valuation proceeding. Is that am I understanding the record properly? Is that Your Honor. Position? Your Honor, we want the compensation both for the raisins that were transferred to the reserve system that were sold at below market price, that difference in what the below market price was and the market price, as well as the fair rental value of the land that the horns were burdened over the last 40 years to hold this government property on their own land. Would you consider, would in, it factor into that analysis in any way, uh, the value that you have obtained that, the, that has flowed back to the producers from the, the regulatory stability. Your Honor, the, the possible regulatory stability is more of an intangible benefit, and the precedent of this court has always been fair market value. Any possible more stable market really isn't one of the things that the court considers when deciding what is fair market value. It, it, tell me why, why, if we agree with you that it's a taking, that the proper remedy is not just to reverse and direct the entry of a judgment. As I understand the facts, the government came to the horns demanded the raisins, and they said, no, we've, we've sold them, right? And we've given the money as handlers to the producers. And the government then said, we're going to fine you for the amount of what you sold the raisins for. So if we agree with you on a taking, why would we, why would we remand to have some other additional uh, remedy proceedings? Why wouldn't the remedy precisely be the amount that the government uh, demanded in the in the USDA proceedings. Well, Your Honor, the Horns only recently decided that they felt the raisin marketing order was unconstitutional and did not comply with it and kept their raisins instead. But they have been under this system for over 40 years. This has been a taking of their property for the last 40 years, in addition to what the government claims that the Horns now owe. Therefore, Your Honors, this. The horns deserve that compensation for over those past 40 years of the raisins that were transferred to the reserve system and sold at below market price, as well as the last 40 years that the horns had to burden their property. Now, turning back to the Loretto standard briefly, 
In United States v. Cosby, this court held that even an airplane flying overhead could be a taking if it deprived the owner of the full enjoyment of his land. Here, the horns have been deprived the full enjoyment of their land. This government supply of raisins burdens their land and tells the horns what they can't do with it. Your Honors, thus, because a taking is... Is that what zoning's about? They can't build a high-rise on residential property, uh, and uh, the high-rise happens to be the highest and best use for the land. And the owner of the property says, I could have gotten $5 million in return for my high-rise, but uh, I'm stuck with a residential property where I get $100,000. They took my property. Is there something wrong with that? Your Honor, this, this still is a physical invasion of the Horn's land in that they haven't been able to decide how to use their full benefit. It was the Horns' property, and then the government came in and said, we are now going to store our raisins here. Therefore, it's a Loretto-style taking. Thus, because a finding of a taking is justified, Your Honors, I see that I'm out of time. May I briefly conclude? Sure. A finding of a taking is justified both as a per se invasion under the Loretto standard and as a condition on the grant of a land use permit where the government has failed to show rough proportionality. This court should reverse the Court of Appeals and find a per se taking occurred and the horns deserve just compensation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Glassberg. All right, Mr. Hawkins. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, my name is Will Hawkins, counsel for the respondents, the United States Department of Agriculture. Your Honors, this case is about the USDA exercising its substantial authority to condition the horn's entry into the raisin market with a program that benefits raisin farmers by stabilizing prices. If the, if the USDA went in and, it, as I understand the facts, they actually didn't get these raisins because the horn said, we're not giving you our raisins. That's correct, right? Justice Stabber. If, if the USDA sent its agents physically into the farm, loaded the raisins on the trucks, does the United States take the position that that would be a taking, yes or no? No, Justice Dever, because even in that case under the Loretto framework, it would not be a total interference with the property right because the horns maintain that equitable interest in the sale of the raisins by the RAC. So they had that equitable interest, so it wasn't a total interference, though it then would have been a physical invasion, so it would have been closer to a taking. But on the front, oh, I'm sorry. But on the front end, it's a taking. It, it, no. It triggers the just compensation analysis. Uh, no, uh, Justice Duncan, under Laredo, this court held it had to be a total and permanent invasion. So the fact that they retain an economic interest itself means it's not a permanent or total interference. Didn't, well, didn't, didn't, didn't the apartment owner in Laredo retain, I mean, he, he, he owned the apartment building and there was, there was, he had the ability to rent the apartments and yet there was the invasion of the property interest so how, how is this not, and, and in fact, one of Justice Marshall's footnotes for the court, he, he said this actually is a taking. The, the distinction with that example in Loretto is that there the cable equipment took up space on the roof of that building such that the owner of the building had no equitable interest in doing anything with that piece of property that was now burdened with the cable equipment. Instead, here the horns maintain an equitable interest, so they're essentially still receiving something from the RAC. Well, they receive a percentage. They don't get, the uh, according to the record, uh, sometimes they get zero return, and, and they don't get the full uh, return price. So if the government took raisins worth $100 and gave them $50, wouldn't that be a taking? Your Honor, in this case, it's... No, no, my hypothetical. If the, I'm sorry if you could clarify, if the, if the government took... government took raisins worth $100 and handed the uh, horns a check for $50, is that a taking? That could be a taking, Your Honor. The Why isn't it a taking? Well, because if the $50 received is tied to the equitable interest of the raisin. So if it was just an arbitrary token, here's a $50 check for your $100, that would be a taking. I don't understand. The, I'm sorry, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Absolutely, way? Justice Duncan. So the distinction here is that the reserve raisins are sold by the RAC under the regulatory duty to maximize producer returns. So they're sold with the, the intent and the obligation to get as much profit sent back to producers as possible. So I'd like to go back to the takings and the physical invasion issue for a moment. 
isn't applying a 47% reserve tonnage requirement analytically indistinguishable from the government marching in and occupying 47% of the land that the Horns were devoting to growing raisins? Absolutely not, Justice Duncan. How so? A footnote in the Laredo case noted that the case could come out differently if instead the statute allowed the landlord himself or herself to install the equipment on the roof so they could choose where it would be done rather than having a third party physically invade by installing that equipment. So by virtue of the horns having that personal autonomy to set up the raisin reserve however they want, they can separate it on their property in a, in a separate silo, in the garage, in the corner of the property. But my hypothetical is, regardless of how they decide to store it, 47% of, of their property that produces raisins at some point before the raisins go into a silo has been essentially taken over by the government. So what I'm trying to understand is why this, why that doesn't make it a physical taking? What, what property rights in that bundle of sticks uh, that, that constitute ownership do the horns retain in the reserve race and tonnage? Well, they retain two critical um, elements. First, they retain possession. So the, the raisins re remain on their property until they are sold. Moreover, they also retain that equitable interest. So essentially, they're getting the proceeds from the RAC disposing of those raisins. So they retain those equitable interests. So well, the it's equitable interest is, uh, might address whether there's just compensation. But the question is whether there has been a taking. There's two steps to this process, right? Yes, Justice Niemeyer. One is the taking, and one is the just compensation. And so if, let's just change the hypothetical, the government tells the horns to stack the raisins on the backside of the land and let it rot. You can't sell those raisins this year because we have an oversupply. Is that a taking? Under the strict Loretto framework, unless there was a literal physical invasion, like the court stressed, no. So if a government employee came and set so up those bins, yes. I impose a, a penalty. If you don't do it, I'm going to impose a penalty equivalent to the market value of those raisins. And that was the penalty in this case, actually. And so the compulsion to put those raisins into a, uh, a rotting pile is mandated by the value of the raisins themselves. You say that's not a taking? The, the simple fact of having the RAC framework allow the horns the choice of where to put it on their property, in addition to not having... no benefit? They, uh, what kind of benefit is that? You put it on the back third of the property or the middle third of the property or the uh, back 50 acres? They put it in a pile, and they can't use the raisins. Justice Niemeyer, what, what I'm attempting to distinguish is that this case doesn't fall under the narrow exception in Loretto, the idea of a permanent but physical invasion, and that it should be looked at by well, Nolan Dolan. Physical invasion may be when you can't move land. You have to invade it. You have to go on and occupy it. But we're talking about personal property, and we're depriving the horns of the normal use of personal property, which is, in this case, uh, to sell it at the price they want and when they want. Justice Niemeyer, this court has frequently held, like in the Lucas case, that personal property, particularly commercial personal property like raisins, has always been subject to less takings protection because you expect sure, a certain does amount that of. mean the government can take all personal property? Certainly not, Your Honor. Okay, what is, what is what, the limit? Yeah. Well, in this case, the, the RAC does not fall under this Loretto framework because there isn't that literal physical... Get Loretto. Just, let's talk just basically uh, about if they come, the government comes and takes my automobile or says, I can't drive my automobile anymore. Put it in the garage. You can't drive it. If you drive it, we will fine you the cost of the automobile. Is there a taking of that automobile? If that is a permanent physical invasion, you're not allowed to use that automobile permanently, yes. That How about a year? How about one year? They tell me I can't use that automobile for one year. Is that a taking? That may be more of an edge case, Justice Niebuyer, but here with the RAC... The, well, no, uh, stick with that ca hypothetical. Why is it an edge case? Well, under Loretto, it w needed to be explicitly a permanent well, taking. That was the why, framework... Why, was, why are we limited to Loretto in terms of if, if the government came and said we're fighting a war, um, and we need your boat, and we hereby commandeer it, get in touch with the, the, the bursar's office, uh, to contact the admiral, but we need this boat. Is that a taking? It's personal property. 
Would you agree, again, on the two steps? First step, is there a taking? Is that a taking? Absolutely, Justice okay. Debra. How about this hypothetical along the same lines on this first question? All right, instead of cash for clunkers, let's talk about cars for crats, for short for bureaucrats. There are, there are 14 car manufacturers in the United States that have manufacturing facilities in 30 states. What if the Congress decided, or the GSA decided by regulation to say, our bureaucrats need some nice cars. So a condition of um, your being able to sell cars in America is that you give us 20 percent uh, of the cars, but just by lease. So you get to keep the title, and then when they come off lease in seven years, we'll sell them and we'll give you the proceeds. Is that a taking? That could run into rough proportionality issues. No, no, no. But no, that, but, but before, but is it, a, is that, is that a taking before we, before we even decide whether to go into Nolan and Dolan, which are really uh, land use cases, right, never have been extended by this court, on the first question, is basically an edict from the government to every car manufacturer, we're taking 20 percent of the cars you manufacture, and our bureaucrats are going to drive them for seven years, and when they come off lease, we'll give you the proceeds. Sometimes it'll be zero, because sometimes some of our bureaucrats are really tough on cars. Some, some really take care of them. Um, is that a taking? Justice Dever, that could be a taking, yes. The distinction here instead... It doesn't make sense with your earlier position, which was permanent. Every hypothetical that Judge De uh, Justice Dever gave you was a temporary deprivation of the property, completely, but temporary. And your concession that that was a taking, for instance, the commandeering uh, of, a, of a ship was a taking. But yet, when I come and ask you about the raisins, you say, oh, it's only temporary, uh, and therefore it's not a taking. I don't understand what the property owner has to claim under the Constitution if the government comes in and takes a car for seven years and then returns it to you. And, and you say, oh, that's not a taking because it's a residual interest. Well, here, the raisins on the Horns property are not even remotely close to being stored there permanently because, quite literally, they're sold off in batches as the year goes on. And that makes it better that that one limited right that you claim they had of possession, although they can't touch or do anything with the raisins, that they lose that more quickly and that makes it less of a taking? Well, it makes it less permanent under the why, courts. I, don't, I think part of the problem that I'm having is understanding why you think that's determinative. Every single year, uh, the, reserve, the, the requirement will kick in to some degree or not. I mean, it may fluctuate, but every single year there's some imposition of a reserve tonnage requirement. Why isn't, why isn't that a permanent um, imposition, even though the value may vary from year to year. Well, for instance, in any given year, the reserve raisin could set aside literally 0% from the, from the horns crop. Moreover, when without that literal physical invasion that the court stressed in Laredo, the actually having a third party step onto the land to administer this interference, it didn't qualify under Laredo's narrow framework. But, that, but getting back to the, to the original question of why, why, why is Laredo the jumping off point for the analysis if you concede that if a Coast Guard admiral comes and seizes a person's ship and says, we need your ship for, for this upcoming battle. We'll give it back to you, assuming it doesn't get sunk. And, and it doesn't, thankfully. And they come back and they give it, and the admiral gives it back a year later. Is that a taking? That you don't have sort of Laredo in physical invasion of lands. It's, 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 it's total personality, is it? If the government takes the boat and gives it back mm -hmm. a year later, right? If it was a permanent physical invasion. Yes, that could be a taking, but that's just would be. Is it's it would be permanent? The it's, hypothetical it's not permanent. is that you took it for a year. The the question is, I don't quite understand how you're defining a taking. In other words, the uh, don't we look at uh, common law property rights? And if the government totally deprives a person of a property right during a life, a portion of the life of that property, seven years for an automobile, isn't that a taking? If the entire bundle of sticks receives essentially a severance, like this court was explaining. Not a before. severance. My hypothetical is they're going to return it. And you say that's not a taking? 
No, if the entire bundle of sticks has a severance, as in there is a, a limitation on every single one of the sticks in the bundle. And how right, isn't but, but, there, but, but, I think is the question. Yeah, right. How stick is with, there not? the automobile. For an automobile, if, Seven years. if they receive an economic interest back from... A compensation issue. In other words, the question, uh, uh, let's just take the grapes again. Sure. If the government didn't pay the horns anything, would that be a taking? If there was uh, under... Paid which nothing. Took the said, we have too many grapes, put them on reserve, we'll dispose of them later someplace else, but we'll dispose of them and they don't pay the horns anything. Is that a taking? No, under the regulatory framework of Nolan Dolan, it's a condition on the horns entrance to the raisin market. Just like you could condition, say, a, fact, a prospective factory owner has to abide by these regulations. So, 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 the, so in the hypothetical on, on the cars, that's not a taking according to the United States? If the hypothetical being that the car would be returned with... No, just no. It's going to come off lease and it's going to, you know, it's going to be then sold on the market and the government says, well, if it's worth anything, we'll give you the money. But, it's, but it's, if it's for that seven-year period, you're, you're saying that's not a... As distinct from this two-step inquiry that, that the justices are asking you about of is there a taking versus is there just compensation, is that a taking? It, under Nolan Dolan, which is the, the, the case here, we're talking about a, essentially an admissions ticket to enter the market. That's my question, is it? Do you think that that, do you think that, that actually controls the analysis? How about this hypothetical? How about if there's a peninsula of land, 1,000 acres are owned by the United States and 1,000 and 1, acres are owned by a property owner, and he decides to cut 50 acres of his timber, and the United States notices and says, boy, that gives us a little better view of the sea. Um, we're going to come in and clear cut the timber. You still have title to the land. We'll sell the timber. We'll give you the proceeds. Is that a taking? Is that a taking to come in and cut a citizen's timber when the person says, I don't want you to cut my timber? And they say, well, you know, you cut 50 acres of your own timber. So now we have a license to come in. Is that a taking as distinct from if they sold all the timber and gave the money to the landowner there might be a debate about just compensation, but on the first question, is that a taking? That is a taking, and the distinction here in the Horns case instead is that this is a condition on entering the raisin market. I see my time has elapsed. may be allowed to answer and conclude. In this case, it was a condition on entering the raisin market. So this wasn't something That's like... just a recasting in, in some kind of formula that it's not a condition. They have raisins they own a property interest on, and the government says you can't sell that and the government doesn't pay them anything. And you say that's not a taking because it's just a condition of entering the market. Under I don't the, understand that at all. Justice Niemeyer, under either framework, so the petitioner mentioned the Loretto framework, it's not a physical invasion if the third party didn't actually set up the structure. And under Nolan Dolan, instead, we no, see... No, this yeah, you have to stick with the hypothetical. I mean, the hypothetical is the government tells them they can't, they have to put these raisins in reserve, just the way this case is but they don't pay the horns anything. And you said that's not a taking. Unless there was a physical invasion, no, because that's, Loretto requires that physical invasion, not just a total depletion. I think I understand. If I may be allowed to briefly conclude? Sure. Your Honors, because under either of the two frameworks that the petitioner mentioned, Laredo, there was no total permanent physical invasion, literally with a third party stepping onto the land. And under Nolan Dolan, this meets the, the nexus and rough proportionality requirement. This was not a Fifth Amendment taking, and the court should affirm the lower court's decision. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hawkins. Mr. Glasper? Yes. Tell me how you define a taking. Your Honor, a taking is any physical occupation of one's property. Well, we have personal property, so we don't physically occupy it. How do you take personal property? Your Honor, in the fact that the government took title to these raisins. Is title dispositive? No, Your Honor, but the so government... So that's not the limiting principle. What is the limiting principle on when a taking occurs? Again, we have Laredo, we have Nolan and Dolan, which are land use cases, but just in general, what is the limiting principle on a taking? It's not taking title. What is it? Your Honor, it seems to be more of an ad hoc basis based on how much no, property rights... Say it's the deprivation of the normal property interest that a person has in personal property. They denied them the right to use it, to sell it, to hold it, to get money from it. Isn't that really what a taking is, a personal property? Yes, Your Honor, we would absolutely agree. And that accords with James Madison's 1792 essay entitled Property. 
Yes, Your Honor. And he was the author of the takings clause. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Now, you mean <laughs> we should look at this little article to see what the Constitution says? No, Your Honor. There's multiple precedents from this case that... I mean, Jefferson might have disagreed. Your Honor, Loretto is the standard, and Loretto shows that any physical occupation is a take. But you, it doesn't... I think the, the questions are suggesting, and I thought you had backed away from asserting that a physical deprivation is necessary, that you can eliminate so much of, the, uh, of an owner's ability to utilize personal property that it constitutes a taking without a physical invasion. Yes, Your Honor, that applies to the taking to the raisins. To that, I absolutely agree. That why do you keep insisting on a physical invasion? There's, it doesn't make sense with personal property. Well, Your Honor, because... The government tells them, destroy 20% of the raisins. We don't care where, how you destroy them. Just destroy them because we don't want them in the market. Is that a taking? Your Honor, I see my time has elapsed. May I answer your question and then of conclude? Yes, Your Honor, that is a taking. I, well, I, then how does that fit the definition you keep falling back on? There's no physical invasion. Your Honors, I meant to imply that there are two takings here of the horns raisins, and then because the government has title to these raisins, that the horns must keep them on their own property. Their property then also is burdened, and it constitutes a second taking. Well, that's an uh, interesting theory. You're, you're claiming that the real property now is being taken because it's occupied by the raisins? Yes, Your Honor. Is that something you presented below? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Thus, because a taking has been found under the Loretto framework, this court should find a person... So what if they take the raisins and put them in the public dump? Your Honor, because the horns would have been deprived of almost all of their property rights, essentially all then of their property rights... there's just one rights. taking. Right. It's That's correct, Your Honor. That would be just the raisins. All right. This court should find a taking occurred and that just compensation is due. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, do I understand under the rules of this court? Uh, you guys actually, are you going to Washington to argue it again? <laughs> uh, you are? Good. Uh, well, we're going to uh, re retire here and make our decision the decision that we've been asked to make. Uh, it may not be totally satisfying because we're not sure what to do with the raisins. <laughs> I like the wine better myself. And so we'll do that and get our further instructions from the report. Thank you very much. We'll, um, there's a custom in the Fourth Circuit uh, that uh, we can imitate here, I think, today. Uh, after each case in the Fourth Circuit, the judges come down and greet counsel uh, before they retire. And if my colleagues will permit me, uh, Will will come down and greet you and then uh, exit. Please join me in giving our finalists a well-deserved round of applause. So the judges have obviously gone out to deliberate. Um, they'll be back momentarily. If you could stay in this general vicinity so um, we can get the results out to our competitors as soon as they come back in. So thank you.
And be seated, please. Uh, we've almost got the opinions finished, but not quite. <laughs> it was long enough, wasn't it? And that's uh, because uh, the decision uh, was a very close one, and uh, we want to congratulate the, both of you. You've gone through a long process, and you've gotten here on a case that is very difficult, I think, the Supreme Court's going to have a lot of debate along the same lines. Uh, we have uh, weighed and weighed and weighed both of your performances and found them both uh, so close uh, in quality, but uh, uh, we have decided to uh, award Mr. Glassberg as winner. What we'll do, um, if you're interested, is we'll uh, provide a little critique and comment if you want. Um, it's one of the benefits, I think, of this process. The uh, case uh, is difficult because it doesn't fully uh, acknowledge, as it's presented to you, that uh, when you take property, uh, there may be a difference in concepts and uh, principles um, between taking personal property and real property and uh, regulation that burdens property. Um, and uh, maybe this case might be one, a vehicle, where they can start laying this out. And you probably could help them out a little bit, having studied this so frequently. But why don't we? Uh, uh, give you some comments. Why don't I begin with Justice Dever and uh, let you uh, make some comments and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you. Uh, I want to uh, commend both advocates who just did an outstanding job and uh, I know how long the competition has been going on because I know a lot of the members of the Moot Court Board and I know how hard they've been working on this, this competition and I know how hard just pro progressing through all the rounds to get to this point with 
uh, exams coming up soon and, and everything else, um, that you really uh, both did an excellent job um, uh, in, in connection with the case. I, I think one of the sort of overarching um, things to remember um, about any type of advocacy when you're talking about uh, cases, and especially something like this where a problem where, as I understand it, you were limited to the number of cases that you could read, um, is even with that limitation, facts are always going to animate whatever legal principles a court is writing about. Um, but that doesn't mean that you as advocates or we as lawyers shouldn't think about first principles and say, yes, the facts animate these, these legal principles that, for example, in the Loretto case, that this is an apartment building and the placement of a, of a cable box where the, the owner could continue to rent. But that doesn't mean that, that as a matter of first principle that there's some physical invasion requirement. It just happened to be that those were the facts the court was talking about, or even in Nolan and Dolan that you're in the land use world and you have um, uh, uh, this essential nexus and rough proportionality test uh, designed that, that there may, you have to sort of step back and say, well, how do we get there? Um, and then, for example, if, if you're the government, for example, in this case, to kind of think back, you're not limited in terms of just your general knowledge, even as one else having taken con law to try and say, well, if we're dealing with a highly regulated agricultural market. And if I learned that the government can prohibit a farmer from growing something, what can I use then logically to, to create an argument consistent with the position of the United States that you're called on to advocate, and at the same time be ready to concede points um, on what I think in a number of things are obvious takings, and then clarify, but that's not this case. That's not this market. Uh, so that, you're, that you're, the ability to, to have kind of thought through even outside of just the cases that you have read and in reading them, remembering that the facts of the cases are going to animate the legal principles, but step back and think about kind of first principles about, you know, if the government physically came in and with agents and started loading up the horns raisins, is that a taking? Right um, or seized a steamboat, uh, or, or whatever, and then kind of w work off thinking, and so that you then, as an advocate, can maintain credibility by answering directly the court's questions and then clarifying. But that's not this case. So, but again, I want to compliment both of you. Just did absolutely terrific, Justice Duncan. Uh, I wanted to. Um particularly commend Mr. Glassberg for something that even seasoned lawyers don't do well necessarily, and that is recognizing and going with a friendly question. Uh, you got fed some really lovely softballs toward the end. And you, but you would be surprised at how many times lawyers would go, oh, no, 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 I don't, you know, they just, they're in such a combative mode that they don't want to accept the fact that um, a judge might be giving them a line of response uh, that would be useful. I've heard uh, Chief Justice Roberts talk about how he would prepare for oral argument, and he said that he would always pick a, a very bright non-lawyer to describe his argument to in three to four sentences. And if he couldn't do that, then he knew that it wasn't clear enough and he had, he had to back up and make sure that he was communicating it holistically and sim in, in not simplistic terms, but at least in terms that are clear enough and conceptually uh, sound enough uh, that they are compelling on their own. And I think that's particularly useful in a case that is this complicated. And I, it, it picks up on, on what Justice Dever was saying, and that is just back up for a minute. What are, we, what are we talking about? What's at issue here? And hopefully that would allow you to get a clear sense of what 
you need to hold on to and what you can let go. Because you had to concede the boat. You had to let go of the boat. And so if, once you let go of the boat, what was your next line of defense? So I think sort of backing up and thinking about it in terms of what can I sell to a very intelligent non-lawyer is a good way to think about that. I think you both did a great job with a very difficult question uh, and a case that I argued with two of my lost clerks about for an hour yesterday. We just, we just went around and around. Um, so I, I sympathize, but, but well done. May I ask if you have any questions you would like to ask for us? Is that appropriate? Can I do that? Let, let me just uh, make a few uh, comments, and then uh, what we'll do is open it up if anybody has a question. Keep it. Uh, one of the hot questions is, what do you wear under your robe? That type of thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't believe, can't believe you said that. <laughs> I can't believe you said that. My clothes, pants, stuff. <laughs> um, there's, some, yeah, there's some basic questions that um, uh, I want to relate to you about oral argument and um, uh, comment a little bit how you fit in those. Uh, uh, first of all, there's always a question is how effective is oral argument? What's the importance of it? And uh, I can say that you should never underestimate the power of an oral argument. The, uh, uh, judges uh, routinely get uh, shaken by oral arguments, sometimes even flip after oral arguments. I've seen all of these examples. The judges have several inputs in making a decision. Your oral argument is not going to be a slamming, slam the desk, yelling at the judge and telling him he has to rule this way. That doesn't work that way. He has his own law clerks who are influencing his decision. He has his colleagues on the bench that are influencing his decision. He has your briefs that are influencing the decision. And he has the oral arguments. So that's a big component of those four influences. And you have to think of it as you're partaking in the way to influence an outcome that you think is the appropriate outcome, the one you're representing in the court. So the question then is, how do you do that in oral argument? What is your approach? And again, it's not. Uh, persuasive to stand up and be a used car salesman and yell at the court. Uh, it's an, uh, time to think in terms of getting into a dialogue with the court. So if the court asks a question, it's an opening to have a dialogue with the judge. A silent court is very hard to argue by. You actually end up almost giving a speech if the judges don't ask any questions. Now, we asked a lot of questions. We didn't give you much room to develop what you were going to say. But that's not unrealistic. That happens from time to time. Uh, it might have been more uh, a hotter court, as they say, uh, because of this context in the moot court, and we knew you were super prepared. But uh, the dialogue then, if you think of it that way, then we sit around a table. And we have our law clerks, we have our colleagues, and you have your lawyers. And we're sitting around a table trying to solve the problem, and you're advocating. So you can't lose credibility there. Uh, uh, there's a demeanor, is a discussion-type demeanor. And I want to say that I think both of you had that demeanor, uh, which is not, we don't always get that in court. We sometimes get the yeller, the pounder, and uh, uh, the person who gets angry at the court, hold it. We're just trying to help out, help us out. And you guys both had that approach. And, and, and uh, that is a big step on uh, becoming a good, good advocate. Uh, another, uh, uh, the questions is a, a very interesting uh, concept in oral argument. There are three types of questions that are usually asked. One is the question is information. What's in the record? What was decided below? Those questions you have to answer directly. You don't guess where the judge is going. You give him the answer straight on. Are there any cases against you? You answer it straight on. Uh, the second type of question is the hypothetical question, where we are taking you uh, on a new set of facts. It's quite important to accept the hypothetical that the judge gives you and answer it head on. You can say, well, that's beyond the facts of this case. 
uh, after you've answered the question. But you have to be able to do that because the judge is testing how far the principle goes. And he doesn't necessarily believe that the hypothetical is going to be dispositive. It sounds like it often, and you don't want to give up on it. And that's the hardest thing for an advocate to do. Uh, uh, getting back to uh, Justice Roberts, he argued several times for our court. And I can tell you, he conceded very quickly when the hypotheticals were beyond the case. Uh, but he would always hone back in on the case. And uh, uh, it, it's a very tough technique to learn. And you have to learn that by, uh, by uh, doing it. The third question is a softball question. And that's where I ask a question uh, that supports my thinking about the case. And you hear it, and as Judge Duncan said, you should recognize that, that maybe at least you've got that judge who's asking the softball, and you have to hit it out of the ballpark. But you don't want to hit it too far out because you have other judges that may be in a different position. So you can't be arrogant about it. You hit it out of the park, that's your position, but in a courteous, nice way, you're still trying to bring on the other judges. And so uh, if you think of the whole argument as a dialogue, um, uh, I think you'll have a lot of success. I thought you guys did. The one area I would critique uh, would be that uh, we did not have an easy time getting our hypotheticals answered. Uh, you wanted to pull us off to another case or to a different circumstance or uh, a different uh, uh, condition. Uh, and I know that's as hard as can be, uh, but uh, uh, work on that. You guys are well on your way. I hope we see you come before our court uh, and argue because I know you'll do very well and you deservedly got this far and both of you deservedly are winners. Uh, we just had to pick one because that's what we were told to do, and, uh, and it was very, very close. Congratulations. Now, I suggest um, we can open it up a little here. If anybody has any questions about this case or oral arguments, we don't have this case before any of our courts. This came from the Ninth Circuit, and uh, it's now before the Supreme Court, and uh, I don't think... Uh, I don't know where the briefing is on it, whether they've scheduled argument on it yet, but it'll be very interesting to follow. But and if you guys have any questions, too, it's fine. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'd probably try to sell the grapes for wine. <laughs> I don't know. That's... that's that's almost an unfair question, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, I had a little bit of, of analytical difficulty with how it was constructed, how it was presented to us. I wasn't quite sure that I saw it as riding on the Loretto Nolan Dolan distinction. So I, I'm not, I'd have to go back and do some more thinking about it and actually some more research before I could get to it because I really had some difficulty with the way it was teed up, like personally. Was that a good punt? You, you, want, to, <laughs> you want any comment on that one? I'd rule in favor of the horns. It's... I, I get if you well I I've, I've had I've had some takings cases recently so I've gotten what at least I think in my own mind at least that I've read a lot of them and um I think it's a real heavy lift for the government um when you when you get to first when you get to first principles um that uh, associated with um taking you know, $700,000 worth of, of, of raisins, even in a heavily regulated market that the government can tell a farmer not to grow crops, but then once a farmer does, it's, a, it's another issue, right? Can the government come in? It, it gets back to what the, a lot of the questions that, that um, Justice Duncan and Niemeyer were asking, that an, the analytic construct is, is there a taking? Compensation may get into issues associated with effects on markets and things like that, um, but but it, it it does seem to me that the government has uh, a real challenge in this case. Anything? Any other questions? How do you win cases? 
Well, uh, we appreciate it. We, I want to thank the uh, uh, Dean Levy and the Moot Court Board and for inviting us. It's been a privilege to be here. Uh, we've enjoyed it. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. We were a little rough on you, but uh, uh, you're big men now. <laughs> Congratulations. What Please I understand. Join me in thanking our panel. And we invite everyone.